So I change my title every time I stand up, I think, but um, there are two separate but tightly related things here. Well, primarily atom-defined devices. Uh, I often say manufacturing of those with the serious intent that, <clears throat> I mean manufacturing, that is it has to be efficient, uh, fast enough, uh, profitable enough, uh, turn out enough of them to satisfy some market. Um, most people think I'm crazy for saying that, but I, I really think we're on the verge of that. Um, I think today, given a small injection of money, like $10 million, we could turn out uh, something like a million devices a year of, of some simple functioning devices, fully packaged, ready to be used in other applications. Um, so one area of interest is ultra-fast, ultra-low power classical devices. Though the world has gone mad right now and put, it, put all its funding into quantum devices for sociological reasons, <laughs> um, <clears throat> we all know that that's not going to happen anytime soon. Now, quantum sensors and some other kinds of devices, they are near term, and we're going to be making those in a couple years. We're, we've made prototypes now. Quantum computers, of course, are, are another story, but it's a great vehicle for study and exploration and training. It's wonderful. This is boring. No one wants to talk about this today, but this is an enormous opportunity. You know, today, the world is using something like 10% of its energy to run ICT generally. TikTok and dancing and kitty cats and who knows what. And it's all really because of the machine learning. That, that's soaking up energy. If you look at that graph and extrapolate to all the world's energy, you get to about 2035. You know, um, it's a totally unsustainable path we're on. We have to do something about this. And if you can do something about this, you know, the amount of money available is, is infinite. But that's not cool. So I do that on the side, and then I do quantum things. <laughs> Tremendous people involved here. Um, I'd like to particularly mention Jason Pitters, a colleague of mine who's a partner in, in so much. There's a National Research Council site just across the road on our university campus, and we've worked together for two decades. Other people who are just bringing so much to this, uh, here's one that's, well, almost nearby. Mike Cromie is a, another expert in scan probe work, and we're teaming up to do uh, the next version of what you're going to see here, the, the spin-based um, quantum aspects. All kinds of wonderful students involved, and I'll try and mention them as I go along. Uh, there is a spin-off company uh, called QSI Quantum Silicon, and it's, uh, it's actually making these things that I'm going to show you from the lab today. So, multimodal imaging, you say? Heck yes. <laughs> we, we have every kind of multimodal imaging. You know, we, we see with picometer scale resolution, three dimensions, spatially, but we also do pump probe, nanosecond resolved, electron uh, uh, motions, uh, dynamics, energy resolved, single electron charge state resolved, uh, flexibility of entities on the surface, and on and on and on. And, and maybe I should really stress this, that we also make measurements that are highly altered by the making of the measurement. And so we really have to know the imaging mechanisms so that we have any chance of deconvolving the natural state of the system or using less perturbative methods. Um, yeah. So, um, I'm going to borrow a few slides from a TED talk from a few years ago because they're meant to be accessible to a broad audience. And I hope that works here. Most of you will have seen this tremendously inspirational work from Don Ogler and company uh, over two decades ago where they moved atoms with intention and spelled out IBM. A tremendous, as I say, a motivating achievement. Um, I liken this to kind of sculpting in soft clay. It's easy to move that material around, but it's easy to damage it too. Um, what we need, so those 
IBM letters and virtually all the like things done in the last two decades, they involve pretty extreme cryogenic temperatures and systems bound by physical interactions, not covalent bonds. And so if you warm them up to 10K or 70K, they just disappear. So these aren't things you could put in a package and sell and use and so on. And in any case, those atoms are almost always studied on a metal substrate where the subtle electronic properties you might be aiming to define and establish and switch, um, they're all shorted out by the metal substrate. So, it, you know, it was beautiful, but more needed to be done. And so you need something, not soft clay, you need to carve in granite virtually. And we need a chisel that can stand up to banging away at something that strong. So, oh, and we need, this is a reference to the shorting out by the metal, we need some way to isolate these little things we want to create from the surroundings so as to, to have their properties survive. People have used mono double salt layers to separate some things from our surface, but those still don't survive any kind of, uh, anything near room temperature. What we've done is use the naturally occurring gap states in the silicon band gap and so we have these atoms that are robustly rock strong to the substrate, and yet they have these split off states that are really allowing us to make zero dimensional things, and etc. cetera. Uh, here's our chisel. We uh, use a field ion microscope, which is the simplest high resolving microscope. You, could, you can make this in your garage more or less, or you can spend half a million dollars to make a better one. But um, <laughs> ultimately, it allows you to see atoms on a very sharp and strongly bound material. And in this case, we've, we've developed a process that etches away tungsten atoms or other atoms, I don't have time to show, and actually leaves a monolayer of a rock hard, uh, in this case, tungsten nitride material. So other people, Hans Werner Fink, decades ago, made a perfectly sharp atom tip, but it couldn't survive anywhere near room temperature. It would just self-anneal. This thing, we can, we can heat that to 1200 C and not an atom moves. And we can ship it around the world. I can ship that atom to you and you can take it out and use it. Um, it's good, it's like chocolate sauce. It's good for all kinds of things. You can make the best electron source for a TEM or an SEM, and we've done that. And it can also be a gas field ion source. It's the, the most monoenergetic, uh, uh, um, what's the word, coherent source. Here's the silicon 100 surface I'm gonna be talking about a lot today. And note that each topmost atom is capped by one hydrogen atom, the white ball. Now Joe Lighting and a bunch of other people explored this initially and they found they could hydrogen terminate a silicon crystal. Greg Kagashi and Yves Chabal at Bell Labs, I remember them doing this decades ago. And, um, and then uh, others took note of it. It was a very interesting problem. You know, everyone thought that the industrially common and necessary still today process of one way or another dipping silicon in HF, well, it must make F terminated silicon because everyone knows a silicon fluorine bond is way stronger than a silicon hydrogen bond. But it turns out that's not what happens and clever people including Krishnan Raghavachari calculated the, the, the full dynamics and the solvation effects and well anyway, you get hydrogen terminated silicon and Joe Lighting showed and, and others of us have shown that we can remove a single hydrogen atom to create a dangling bond. And these things, these distributions we create are stable up to 200 C, not an atom will move in centuries. So one of the most trivial kind of quantized attributes is that we can only make atoms where the lattice allows us to. And when I say make atoms, I, I mean make a naked silicon dangling bond. We're actually removing H atoms. So we can't make a mistake. We can't make uh, 10 kinds of three atoms in a row. We can only make one kind. This is leading toward 
the first ever manufacturing, I use that word again, um, of variance-free components. That's never happened in history. Now, there could be environmental effects that tune a bit, but we, we think we have a handle on that. Um, if we make an error, we can automatically erase an atom. We can simply take a hydrogen atom and put it back. It's really interesting. When you break an H off a of silicon, you have to give it a jolt of energy to heat that bond to break it. We can see, well, we can sense where the H atom is on the tip. Sometimes it's the apex atom. We can see the uh, resolution of our scanning greatly improves with that tiny atom on the tip. And we can see the radically different force curves as we do AFM and feel the tip acting against the surface. So we know very well when we have a silicon tip or a tungsten tip or a hydrogen tip, and we can inter uh, convert. Uh, anyway, here we erased, um, I think Paul's journal, ACS Nano, was silly enough to go along with my silliness. The, the kids submitted a paper called Atomic Whiteout, showing how to erase mistakes. And I thought, well, they'll just reject that and make us change it. But they just printed it. So, it was <laughs> so we have a silly, uh, fun title of a paper. Anyway, so uh, there's a whole bunch of important points here. Let me see what they are. We can make all kinds of things, passive and active components. Um, there will be, and, and there is now, a very simple kind of contact standard lithography preparation for a substrate. And think here of a chiplet that would be mounted adjacent to some other uh, family, uh, part of a family of chips. Um, and uh, all the atom structuring would be done on that chiplet. This is a truly 2D circuitry, which is astounding. That mean, I'm serious that we can make not a simple conducting kind of analog, if you like, wire like this, but in a minute I'll show you something called a binary wire. It's a wire that can have a zero or a one state. Uh, and those wires can cross and not, they're orthogonal in the trivial sense and in, with respect to information. Fabrication is slow but fast, that is, you know, it's a serial process today. Today we're making a, an atom per second or something, but you know, it'll get, with the kind of equipment you, we're using today, it'll get 100 or 1,000 times faster, but we'd have a way to get more than a million times faster, but that takes a lot of money. But there are no multi-layers. There are no vias. There are no interconnects. There, it's a truly two-dimensional surface and where you print everything. You print you know, your wires of various kinds and your active devices and you can make capacitors, you can make FETs. You can, it's, it's really quite remarkable. So uh, here's some examples of printing all the letters of the alphabet in binary ASCII code, just like in your computer. Now, we took this little patch. We, put this, left this defect on the end just to, as a marker. And we erased, so the blue areas are hydrogen silicon terminated, the white things are the dangling bonds. So this is the same area written, what is that, 28 times, um, where we erase it, write something, erase it, write something, whatever you want, as many times as you want, and someone couldn't help but write up the music for the Super Mario video song in atoms. So this is the densest information ever written. Now there are spectacular demonstrations from other groups who've put, um, I'm forgetting the molecule now on a copper surface. They have similar density actually, but their system just melts apart, even if you get to 70K. Yes? What is the size of the actual atoms there? Oh, so um, this picture is, um, I don't know. It, it's about 10 nanometers. Yeah, uh, I'll probably have scales later, sorry. Um, again, not an atom moved. Here I said 500K instead of 200C, but this is a, that's kind of a joke. Now, those of you involved in scanning probe microscopy, and especially those of you who want to make things at this fine scale, you will know that um, there is no perfect scanner in the world. And scanners exhibit all kinds of thermal nasty effects, including one called creep. And this is a thermally activated process. It's actually very related to the domain movement in ferromaterials we saw earlier. Um, well, anyway, uh, we've made a perfect scanner. And we can scan at room temperature 
better than the best scanner scan at 4 Kelvin. And so this is going to really improve um, um, the tool set. We even think we have money. We have, you know, sometimes we all kind of love and hate government grants. Um, they usually make you jump through painful hoops for no reason, just to be, just to torture us. Every once in a while, the craziness falls in your favor. There's this organization <laughs> who wants to give us a million dollars to make a machine, or our company to make a machine, to sell it back to the government, and they'll pay us a million dollars for the machine they just paid for us to make, and the recipient of the machine they buy is us. And then it goes on, and, we, and there's another path to get even more money. So every once in a while, you know, things work out. Uh, now I'm going to show you some magic. I say thousand times faster in quotes. So I just told you that I can cap dangling bonds rather arduously. Now I can load up the tip with many hydrogen atoms, and I can go boop, boop. Oh, I started to say before that we need a jolt of energy to break a bond, but chemists here might find it beautiful and satisfying to know that the making of the H silicon bond is a kind of activationless process. You merely mechanically position the H and the silicon and it just makes uh, with no jolt of energy, even at 4 Kelvin. It, it's just fun and interesting. Okay, now this is a way to cap atoms faster. And how much faster depends on how complex a circuit you're repairing. So this is a 24-bit number we stored. We, just, it's, we were doing all kinds of funny tricks. Um, and we decided, for some reason, we wanted to um, erase these three digits, if you like, and make them zero, make those atoms disappear, as you see we finally do. Rather than meticulously cap each atom, we've learned a trick and we applied it. We made partner atoms to the ones we wanted to erase. We kind of went backwards. We made more dangling bonds. But then we used this astonishing, again, activationless process. This can work at room or four Kelvin. Uh, an intact H2 molecule will impossibly uh, bond to these two atoms, but none of the other atoms here. It has to be just like that, and they will erase a unit like that as you, I don't know, as you, uh, as you see here. And then another molecule comes in and erases that one, and another one comes in and erases that one. And so, we can very, very rapidly go and make dangling bonds. And then with a global effect, you open a valve and close the valve, boom, you just knock them all out. So it's just neat. And this leads to all kinds of other cute things. I'll show you later perhaps uh, uh, an ability to, to sense the arrival of a single uh, molecule, or electron for that matter. Uh, this is just a, Okay, here's just another example of using some of those tricks. We were printing uh, the words, letters, or numbers 150, and we made a mistake. And now in the past, we'd say, oh, gosh, now we have to start over. And you could start over, you know, 20 times before you got something of this complexity right. Our odds were that bad. But now we just erase mistakes. We nibble away at the atoms, put them back where they're supposed to be, and... We made this little present for the Prime Minister a few years ago. Here's a little molecule that Max made. He just sat down one day and drew a pattern, and he made it, just like that. And you can actually see where you'd expect there to be strong bonding inter interactions and anti-bonding interactions. Now, you don't have my trained eye, but it's all there. It's, it's just magnificent. There's a, there's a whole kind of surface chemistry here to be done where the molecules didn't come out of a bottle. We made them where we need them. And, you know, I spent a decade of my life playing with molecular electronics, so-called. It's, it's a really terrible area. And, uh, <laughs> the, and we did some of the best stuff. <laughs> but, um, you know, instead of trying to get a molecule out of a bottle and onto a surface in among wires and all that, why don't you, why don't you just make the molecule and the wires in one step and it's all done? Um, these dangling bonds are magnificent species. They can have different charge states. And by controlling band bending or the local, local Fermi level or the doping density and bulk or variations on those, we can, um, we can have, as we choose, an empty of electrons plus state, a one electron neutral state, two electron negative state. And 
this thing has spin. Now, a lot of you know that most people who tinker around like this with H and silicon and remove it, they're doing so so that they can cause a molecule like PH3 to chemically bond to the little patch of naked silicon they make, and then warm it a bit, get rid of some of the hydrogen, overgrow it as best you can, but never perfectly with epitaxial silicon, and you can make um, uh, qubits or spin entities at least. We can do that with dangling bonds. Um, we, don't need, we don't need no stinking P or B or whatever. We, and we're going to show this real soon. So this is where... Um, uh, and you know, those wonderful workers, Michelle Simmons and others, are brilliant people, achieve so much that I admire. But you know, they, they stretch things a little bit and they always say atomically precise uh, fabrication or something. And in fact, they've never done anything atomically precise, not once. That is, sure, they make atoms, but if you ask them, will you please, on this lattice, make that one and that one, and nothing else, there's no way. They can only make a distribution and look for the, if that happened once somewhere. Um, whereas we can make any number of exactingly placed atoms, including spins, and there's just so much room to do stuff with this. ESR is on the way, and this is where we're teaming up with Mike Cromie and his amazing student, Emma Berger. We we're all had a long chat yesterday, and it's, it's coming soon. Okay, so up till now, I've shown you um, uh, static patterns of atoms, but what I ultimately want to do is control electrons among those atoms. So the atoms are the nest that I've built, or you know, if I control where the highways go, I know where the cars are going to go, etc. So here's a cartoon, but I can show you all of these things for real. Here's an electron and a double well potential that we create every day easily. We can move, uh, we can bias these things in one way or another, and we can position a single electron. So we can make this most elegant, simple bit of information. We can have a bit electrostatically control the next bit, and we can convey information without joule heating. There's no I squared R there. There is, we can argue. You can combine these kinds of lines and you can make logic gates, um, all with extraordinarily low energy consumption and enormous speed. Um, if we make these dangling bonds, we see that the very identically same structure can look wildly different um, depending on the doping level. And I'm just going to say now that we understand that. It, um, well, what do I want to say? Um, I have to go faster. Basically, if you have a Fermi level that's near or in the conduction band, you essentially force electrons to fill this, uh, what would nominally be a neutral state. Uh, if you have an intrinsic material, you have just one electron. If you have a P-type material, you'll have a positive dangling bond. And, and these have ramifications in the images. Uh, very quickly, uh, this is just like a field effect transistor. Here's our atom, our dangling bond. Here's a probe. Think of it as a gate that is moving. It moves along and it bends bands, just like in your textbook. But look at those beautiful things that happen. As you shift an occupied state above the Fermi level, an electron must fall out. And the very moment that falls out, boom, the bands drop back down because you've just taken away a negative charge and gone to neutral, and so you've removed this upward band bending. So it's a kind of positive feedback effect. And there are many, uh, and then it's more complicated because we've left out some steps, but then we can put those in. And I don't expect you to absorb all this now. I just want to say we understand it. Um, now, here's the first study, perhaps, where we were really treating these dots, the, these atoms, as quantum dots. And it raises the silly question, why ever did people study artificial atoms? Why didn't they use atoms? And the reason is essentially that if you, you have to put an atom somewhere for it to be useful, addressable, and in so doing, you cause it to have dispersive interactions and it kind of loses its atomness and it's spread out and it's not, it's not useful in the ways you'd like it to be. Uh, for quantum dot kind of applications people have in mind. 
And, and so I'm thinking of a picture like this where people have a 2D electron gas. You can think of it like a piece of plywood with a layer in the plywood that is the 2D electron gas and then electrodes on top that can kind of punch out a part of that 2D layer and make a zero dimensional thing. And then you can transit electrons through them and all kinds of stuff. So we can do that now very close with our atoms. And so here there's an, one of our dangling bonds. And see this noise here? You know, it's been said many times that the noise is the signal and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's beautiful stuff. You see a kind of trimodal noise pattern. Well, it turns out that if a, a spectator tip not addressing the dangling bond, this could be you know, 10 nanometers removed, this is too short, um, you'll actually see a modulation of the current between the tip and sample where the height has not changed nor has the voltage. But you'll see kind of like this, if it's negative, if it's only one electron, you get a more current, and if it's even less, you get even more current. So what you're seeing is a band bending from a point source that curves away spatially. The tip is way over here on the tail of this, spatial, this electrostatic uh, perturbation, and it's simply seeing the bands bend up and down way over here. So it's, it's identical to changing the voltage between the tip and sample even though we aren't doing so. So we're seeing this noise, fluctuations among quantum states, and we, we're, well, we're looking at it. And for example, you can see noise at a particular distance, and well, all I really want to say now is that a typical tool here is to use a quantum point contact. You have two, two uh, electrostatically controlled bodies. You have them physically close and more so with electrostatic tuning so that you essentially pinch off and you have to think of electron transit as a, a wave. You have to think of the individual discrete modes that can go through that pathway and you can actually pinch it off to zero or one or two. And so tiny charge changes here can ultra sensitively pinch off the waves going through here and you can sense um, single electron charge changes in your quantum dots. And th that's exactly what we're doing with our STM. Okay, next level of complexity. I've shown you these dangling bonds. These are two that are the same. I'm introducing another dangling bond now and you can see the pre-existing one has greatly altered its appearance. This one didn't change and the newly made one looks like the altered one. We're seeing now the ability to make a bond in a trivial way. It's, it's a very weak bond at this point. It's it, the interaction, if you like, the splitting between symmetric and anti-symmetric states is, you know, about 0.1 volt. It's enormous compared to normal quantum dots, which at best are interacting with, what, 100 microvolts. So a thousand times greater interactions. This means you can make a two-level system where Thermal effects are so much less significant. It, it has all kinds of attractive attributes. Um, okay, well, the reason, in brief, these are looking white and not black is that we're, we're taking two negative atoms and we're moving them close together. And at some point, the electrostatic repulsion just demands that one of the electrons leave. And so now we have a double well potential with effectively one electron on one side and it can tunnel to the other side. So we have this beautiful little machine automatically forming. And here you see atoms at large, 2.3 nanometers, 1.5, uh, 1.1. And you can easily see that the, the probability that I have one electron or two electrons shifts and changes with distance. So it's a very tunable, easy to control thing. Um, here's a little movie kind of summarizing that. So we make a single dangling bond. This exact shape is understood. It's, it's a convolution with the shape of the tip. That went too fast. Um, I sped it up and now it, it's too fast. So here's a dangling bond. Look at the kind of overall intensity of this and watch it get brighter. When we make another one, you're seeing that exclusion of an electron and the different band bending and the different appearance of these things. And now we put a perturbation here and we take our double well potential and we tilt it. And we actually create, as we wish, the left hand or the right hand state. And now with an active electrode instead of a fixed charge, we can do this dynamically. And you can think of, you know, 
preparing a state and then at time zero letting it evolve and this is what leads us to make a quantum random number generator and all kinds of other things. There was a popular for quite a while this scheme of quantum dot cellular automata, Craig Lent and Wolfgang Porod and uh, Greg Snyder, uh, great guys to work with, had this amazing system worked out. Uh, people were hypercritical of it just because they're poops. But it's got a lot of brilliant aspects that I can't tell you the number of angry, mean people uh, who I've heard talk about this. Like if you wanted grants on this kind of work, you had to come up with a new name for this kind of structure because if you called it that, it was verboten. Anyway, um, let's go. So we made a kind of unit like that, adjusting the size, adjust the filling. That's at four atom two electron cell. Um, we biased it and you could actually see the creation of that antipodal state. So we, we created the first cell and this is at room temperature where no one thought you could do this. So, you know, the energies are so vast here and the interactions are so strong that it, it suddenly we thought, wow, we can make, you know, we can make the dream QCA insignificant energy consuming ultra fast machine like this with dynamic control. And then you do something like this. And then, well, then you go and make a cartoon. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, and so we started making these circuits, you know, there's a brilliant student, Marco Toucher, uh, an amazing guy, um, making just like the recipe book called for. And then you see, this is about our error rate. There's an atom out of place. Now we can fix that. 10 years ago, we couldn't. And we started making, so people around the world have been enthralled by this model and they've been designing circuits. There's no material, um, system available except the very beginnings of one from Greg Snyder at very low temperature. It works, it's proven, but you know, it couldn't be made. And anyway, we started making these hundreds and hundreds of atoms things, but they're full of errors. They didn't work. It was more an exercise and feeling through the system. Uh, now, so we, we had to go back through everything we'd done again and make it all, everything had to be better. And, and we came out with something like this. So here we've made a pair of atoms, as I've shown you, that can contain one electron. And here's another pair with one and another pair with one electron. Now, multimodal, here's STM, showing you where the atoms are on the lattice. Oh, and you asked me about scale. So scale is about eight angstroms between these, 7.7 uh, .7 angstroms between these rows. So um, this is an AFM image of the very same thing tuned in a certain way so that we're on our kind of Leonard Jones-like plot, we're, we're way out here where electrostatic interactions, if there are any, dominate. And so this is essentially a picture of where the charge is. Very low resolution otherwise, but so you see, it put three little boxes, if you like, with each an electron. Where do the electrons go? They go as far apart from one another as they can. If I put a spring, what I call a spring down here, an electrostatic charge that pushes up, look, we switch this electron from here to here. If I put an input on this OR gate, pushing this electron down, it goes from here to here. And so on and so on. We can make the full truth table of an OR gate and we can make it an AND gate and we can make any gate. Here's the binary line concept. So I've shown you this several times now, a pair with one electron and a perturber, which ultimately will be a dynamically controlled electrode. I've pushed that electron, I've created the right state. But it's, as shown in that funny movie, it's pushing its neighbor and so on. And so we can convey state through a distance without using conventional current. And this is hyper fast and hyper low power. And we can push it the other way and there's all kinds of things. So here's a grandstanding thing. Um, you know, Canadians are supposed to be very modest and um, reserved. So I can't say this is the best thing in the world, but, but Robert Doring does. Um, so he's the head of the famous Kilby Labs where the first integrated circuit was made. And this is essentially the first atomic integrated circuit. These are three devices combined to make a gate, and these were three transistors combined to make a gate. And um, it's, it's revolutionary, I dare say. 
Um, here's an even cooler thing. So now we've taken the same pair, and I can make much more complicated things, but here's just a pair of atoms with one electron, STM pictures, AFM pictures. We sweep the AFM and we see, oh, the electron's on the left. We're not biasing it now. Sweep again, it's on the right. We sweep thousands of times and make this kind of strip chart-like recorder. Very importantly, many sequential measurements do not show the electron jumping with every sweep. In fact, they show it rarely jumps. So I know that while I may be perturbing the electron position, I'm not absolutely controlling it. I'm, I'm safe in saying it's a minor or less perturbation. Anyway, this is a beautiful quantum random sequence. It's the nearest I can think of to the most beautiful kind of quantum, uh, uninterferable, um, random thing is perhaps nuclear decay. Well, that's not very convenient because you can't reset them and you can't, lots of things. Plus you don't want to get radiated. So let's set a quantum well. Let's allow it to quantum mechanically tunnel into the other well. And let's just see when it does that. Now, we're not going to use a million dollar microscope to watch it do that, so we have to make a little circuit. Oh, before I get there, this is even cooler. This is like a Boltzmann machine. This is two pairs, AFM image, traces of all the TikToks going on up there. And so I've got an electron here, an electron here, bistable. Most of the time, the electrons are in the furthest condition. That's the ground state. Sometime one comes in, or degenerately the other one. So that's the first excited state. And even more rarely, they both come in. So this is, a, this is an absolute temperature measurement. And now here it's biased. Here I take, these are the very same atoms, as far as I know the same electrons, but that's another shit. Um, now we just put another atom here. We're using our perturber trick, just a minus here. And look what happened. This one, which was predominantly left, is now predominantly right, because we've biased it. We've made it always a bit like that. And the bias on that, just like in our binary line, has strongly biased this one, and it's always over here. And you can see these two weren't equivalent. There's a defect over here that's been causing this slight uh, inequivalence of those. So this to me is, uh, well, here I'll show. You know, we, can, we could make a living embodiment of this. We could, we could obviate the kind of ugly, expensive Markov chain Monte Carlo calculation to go around this loop and we could get the so-called um, unclamped statistics from a living neural network. We can build in the strength of interaction and the biases. And I've only shown you trivial, permanent kind of things. But we have schemes, I, don't, I, you know, I took away that slide, so of making those variables. That's very exciting to me. Uh, here's the quantum random number generator. Um, this is real data here. Um, I guess I have to show this. And that is, how do you uh, translate? How do you get that information out from the atomic scale to some big fat transistor? Well, you make a single electron transistor. Single electron transistors are notoriously horrible things. They're, it's like the quantum point contact in its ability to sense uh, less than an electron charge. It's the most sensitive known charge detector, but they're horrible because somewhere when you make these things there's always trap charges and kind of flicker noise there's little things happening that change the bias and you know the current through the transistor changes for reasons other than the, the thing you want to measure um, but we can make a perfect SET so you know normally when you make an SET if you have the best fab in the world you are trying to make something at uh, dimensions that are smaller than your uncertainty and your fat. It's like if I asked you to go in the basement and take the table saw and make a new gear for your Swiss watch, your Swiss watch or something like that. It, it doesn't work. Uh, but here, for the first time, we can make identical SETs. We can have this instead of 100 microvolt, 100 millivolt, actually up to 300. So we can have room temperature single electron. Uh, it's just, so this can lead to a quantum current standard and uh, absolute thermometers, all kinds of cool things. Simple first products, I see them as. Okay, great, 10 minutes. Here's a, not quite an SET demonstration, but it's near enough. 
that I'm going to show it to you because it's kind of easy to see. We're simply measuring spectroscopy through one of these dangling bonds. We just do that once, blue, green, and orange. Blue, green, and orange. At the second point, the green, we introduce two more atoms, which we know from many other studies is a negative thing. And so you're seeing here this pronounced shift in the IV curve. Uh, signals to noise would allow you to, you know, see a 50th of that change or something. So it's, it's quite a robust change. And actually here, we allowed an H2 molecule to just come out of the gas phase and react there. And so you could say this is a, and it comes right back to where it was before. So you can see the ability to detect single electrons over, for us, large distances like 10 nanometers, or in this case, to detect uh, a single molecule. With, it's cool. Uh, all kinds of other bits and pieces I don't have time to tell you. Here, for example, we've taken the 111 silicon surface and we've carved out, with a scan probe, we've carved out a roughly uh, one or two nanometer wide and deep trench, as we like, and we've put two probes with a multi-probe machine into those rectangles, and we've measured the resistance of those wires. And just as you'd expect, you get lower resistance and higher resistance, and, and if you put the probe in anywhere here and outside these boxes, you get the leakage current, or sorry, that's the, yeah, I, I said that backwards, that's, that's the, the flat line here, which magnified, does have a finite slope, but the point is that we have this amazing two-dimensional surface state that's as easy as anything to create, very robust, um, just it's there, and we can turn it into wires of various conductivity, and, and remarkably, these, these atoms, though bound, you know, strong as can be to the other atoms, they're nevertheless surface states that do not substantially couple to the bulk states, and so it's a surface phenomenon. So, you know, we're, well, okay, uh, we can now make perfect wires here. Uh, Furkan made one atom, two atoms, and then he made many two atoms to make a wire, and this can go on in all kinds of different ways. And he can see, just as simple as can be, he can see the quantized states in these, these molecules, if you like. And you can quite easily model this with a kind of appropriate and simple partial teller potential. Or you can do brute force, ab initio, DFT, and you can get even more from this. The, the point is that the access to quantum features has become everyday routine, not heroic. I mean, you need the million dollar microscope today, but it's, it, you know, it, it's really understood and routine and there's just so much more we can do. Uh, I guess I have a couple minutes. We're going to make a magnetometer. Well, this is how we're going to make a magnetometer. Um, you may have heard about this, that supposedly something very near to this is used in the eyes of insects and birds and foxes, and I think probably people have it too, and it's just a vestige of a thing. You can actually make a double well potential, and if the spins, the, t the electron in each well, are um, anti-parallel, then you can shift an electron and make this negative one, uh, one atom negative and the other positive. And if they're parallel, you can't, because of Pauli exclusion, move them together. And so it turns out that process and the statistics of it is, is controlled or is reporting on an external magnetic field. And so basically you can, and what you need here is a spin to charge readout, as in many quantum devices, and that SET I showed you was the perfect spin to charge readout. So you just have an atomic SET beside a pair of atoms with one electron, and you simply read the likelihood of these transitions and, well, a few other things, of course. Uh, no, no, we did model, I should just stop. <laughs> There's no point going crazy fast, oh, five minutes. I'll go slow and enjoy the last five minutes. Um, we can make, back to a classical thing, we can make an A to D converter that's outstandingly uh, efficient. Um, look at this, we, we took the publicly available published uh, diagram for the Google Tensor Processor Unit, the thing that's burning gigatons of carbon and, and polluting the earth so that you can watch kittens. 
And oh, I wasn't supposed to say that on the recording, so I was trying not to say anything I didn't want to have repeated. Sorry, Google. They never funded me anyway. <laughs> Buggers. We went all the way down there and gave a lecture, and they said, wow, this is great, but tell us when it's better. So, you know. My, con my, my, Conrad, my colleague, Conrad Wallace at University of British Columbia and his team, they, I, I failed to tell you, we built this beautiful CAD system. It's called um, SciCAD, Silicon Q8, uh, yeah, QAD. It allows you to lay out, anyone can go on GitHub and download it, and you can, on your computer, you can lay out atomic circuits. It'll only let you make what's physically makeable, and it'll tell you how it would perform right away. And anyway, they extended that, and they, they modeled the crucial part of the GPU, which is the MXU, the matrix multiplying unit, which I must admit lends itself um, to our kind of circuitry. But basically, we swapped out transistors for atoms, and we got a 10,000 times reduction in power at the usual sort of gigahertz clocking. And we don't show here, but we could get 10 times reduction in power and get over 100 gigahertz. And there's no way CMOS is ever going to get there. And 100 times aerial reduction. And you'd think that would sell Google, but it didn't. Um, uh, I'm, I've tired myself out. Oh, oh, God, this is terrible. So now I have another talk that I failed to deliver uh, that's about all the uh, automation and, and machine learning things we've done. Basically, we've learned how to detect when the tip, atomic perfect tip, gets faulty and it starts making these kind of ghost images. And so it can automatically stop the process, fix the tip, go back to work, and you know, print the next atom. So that is a huge step. This, to me, is what really opens the gate and says, you can have a thousand of these things running with one operator, or whatever, 10, 100, and, and you don't need a PhD uh, person sitting there to, to massage the tip and get it working again. It just gets fixed. And anyway, uh, this is why I think we can manufacture things. And then and, uh, you know, we can tell a duck from a dirty duck, and we can train a machine. And then we can find spaces, and we can segment, and then we can, <laughs> then we can pick a place that's suitable, and we can print automatically a tiny gate there. And blah, 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 blah. Oh, so many other modes of imaging. We'll just go fast forward here. There, I mean, there's so many things we've cataloged. You'll go blind trying to figure all this out, but we've done it all. And it's a very important catalog because we know all the kinds of defects virtually that ever appear on silicon and their rarity and their effect on our nearby circuitry. So we know how much radius to give them, more or less. We know how perturbative they are. All of these things are built in. I was just talking to these guys this morning in uh, Munich, um, and look at this silly thing, hexagons are bestagons, that they, uh, they got that published, and uh, <laughs> that's better than my atomic whiteout. Um, and, and look at this, they, they've come up with this tiling pattern where they can, they can foresee how we could simultaneously kind of avoid defects that are completely unimportant, but get dense circuitry, and uh, it's just beautiful. And I didn't tell you about one of the things that was in the title of my talk, which was how we get the macro to atom connection, but if you buy me a beer or something. Um, so, here's another anti-Canadian statement. This is as disruptive today's, to today's technology as the transistor was to the vacuum tube, and um, you guys are going to have to move to Canada, and this is where it's all happening. Okay, I think that's the end. Not if, only when. That's good enough. There's a thousand more slides, but I stop. <laughs> Thank you.